Good afternoon and welcome to this special event launching our new report, Thinking Inside the Box, how opinion polls shape security debates and policy in the UK. My name is Richard Reeve. I'm the coordinator of the Rethinking Security Network, and I'm delighted to be joined this afternoon by not only the report's author, Lilla Fernley, but also two academics who are real thought leaders in surveying opinions about security in the UK. From University of Warwick, we have Nick Vaughan Williams, and from University of Coventry, Saria Trugalil Contract. It's been an enormous pleasure working with all three of them on this report and also on our Alternative Security Review project. Now, part of that project to redefine the way the UK thinks about security policy has been testing out or experimenting with different ways of understanding how ordinary people or people from different backgrounds and identities perceive their own security needs and priorities. Thanks to the research and analysis, you can see how opinion polling is currently used, but how it also sometimes gets in the way of uh, assessing what people really think. And she has some really great recommendations to get past that. So the format for this afternoon will be first we'll hear from uh, Lilla Burnley, her findings and recommendations. We'll then hear from Nick on the wider context of security polling and the mixed methods research. And then we'll hear from Saria on some of the specifics of surveying minoritized or underrepresented groups and so how we've been using these methodologies in our own alternative security review. We'll then have a question and answer. So please feel free to answer your or ask your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen while everyone's talking. Uh, now, over to Lila for the first presentation whose voices are reflected and whose are absent, whose definition of security and threat and appropriate response are presented, what questions are asked and what's missing. Ultimately, it led us to question whether these surveys were able to reflect the opinions of a diverse UK public and whether they could be shaping the debate rather than simply reflecting public opinion. Given this potential influence on public um, and wider political narratives about security, these questions Felt particularly pressing. The study aims to address some of the questions. It focuses on how public opinion on security issues in the UK has been measured and assessed, and it looks at how policy makers have consulted on and responded to it. It, analyses, it analyzes how different approaches to understanding the nation's security needs shape the outcomes, and it poses questions on whose security is privileged, whose perception on security is privileged, and whose, whose perceptions of threats are prioritized. It asks what security response options are presented and which are excluded. It also identifies um, approaches that have been used to reveal a, a richer, more diverse and arguably um, more comprehensive picture of UK security perceptions. And it offers recommendations about how things could be done differently, including in future security reviews. And um, as I think Richard mentioned, the findings also have informed the alternative review being carried out by Rethinking Security. So the research for the study was divided into two parts. The first part looks at the surveys themselves. It examines the framing, the language and focus, the questions in, and including the questions not asked, the gaps. It draws on 39 public opinion polls and surveys carried out in the UK over the last decade with questions on security and insecurity, UK foreign intervention in conflict, specifically the government's um, response to the Syria conflict and UK government security policy priorities and spending. The second part explores the relationship between public opinion and policy making, focusing on the role of public opinion um, on the debate on intervention in Syria in 2013, looking at the Commons debate, and the process of public consultations for the UK government's 2015 and 2021 national security strategies. While there are some notable exceptions, um, the study found that the majority of the surveys reviewed do not make explicit the definition of security on which questions are based. Rarely do they seek to understand how the public understands and defines security they tend to frame security in terms of the state, national or multilateral interests, rather than people or communities or citizens. They reflect elite definitions of security and threats, 
and are not inclusive of minority or marginalized perspectives. And finally, they tend to favor militarized responses. For example, of the 16 reviewed surveys on UK intervention in Syria between 2012 and 2018, only six tested public support for non-military approaches to the situation. Of the 17 questions on security challenges or threats in the 12 um, surveys that contain these questions, only four refer to citizens or communities. And importantly, none of these were fielded within the five years before the 2021 integrated review of security, defense development and foreign policy. None of them frame security in terms of people or communities. The way that security and threats, threats and challenges are framed, i.e. who needs protecting from whom or what, is likely to influence what approaches or responses the public deem appropriate and legitimate for building and maintaining security. The assumptions in most of the surveys that we reviewed appears to be that security means an absence of threats to the state or its interests. However, if security were defined differently, for example, a shared freedom from fear and want, a very different picture may emerge. The majority of um, surveys use predefined lists of threats. These largely reflect the, the priorities of policymakers. Only two of the reviewed surveys include open questions alongside those closed questions. Um, and responses to those open questions revealed that the, the public tend to prioritize different security challenges. Um, and and that they're, they're, not, they're not necessarily aligned with those presented in the pre-identified lists. Threats that disproportionately affect minority and marginalized groups were mostly absent from the surveys that we reviewed. For example, racism, far-right extremism, sexual gender-based violence. Again, there were some exceptions, but this was the majority. Some surveys um, included minority or marginalized groups among the list of possible threats. For example, some included refugees from conflict zones, economic migrants. Um, and furthermore, minority or marginalized perspectives, perspectives may not be visible in representative samples, so these perspectives are missing. There's also the risk that designating these already marginalized groups as potential threats to UK security could reinforce suspicion and hostility um, and increase threats to their own security. This is something that needs to be considered. The exclusion of threats in these predefined lists that disproportionately affect minority or marginalized groups from most of the surveys begs the question of whose perceptions of security are prioritized. It also raises the question about how, who identifies the list of, of security threats, who decides what can or cannot be deemed a threat. Do the security issues presented really reflect the public's perceived sources of insecurity or the existing concerns of those who commission the research and set the questions? I'm now going to turn to, to the research um, that was on the relationship between public opinion and policy making. This relationship, as I'm sure everyone listening knows, is, is complex in that governments and politicians seek to both influence and respond to it, untangling which is which is, is, is complex. There does appear to be a strong link between well publicized public opinion polls, including those conducted by um, newspapers and on, on sort of front page news and the government's decision on military intervention in Syria in 2013. But this isn't always the case. Um, missile strikes went ahead in 2018 against poll findings. So public opinion clearly is not always the, the, the sole or decisive factor in this. Efforts to incorporate public opinion in national security strategy development have been limited public consultations for the UK government's 2015 National Security Strategy and Strategic Defence and Security Review, and especially the 2021 Integrated Review of Security Defence Development and Foreign Policy, the Integrated Review, were limited to online public consultations run by the Cabinet Office. 
there weren't any uh, proactive attempts by government to reach out to a wide range of stakeholders, despite this being recommended, well, public stakeholders, the general public, despite this being recommended by external e experts ahead of both reviews. The online public consultations for the integrated review didn't seek to understand how the public defines security. Furthermore, although it made use of existing public opinion research, no new research was conducted as part of it. This shows a, an apparent reliance on, on past public opinion research or existing public opinion research, i.e. The, 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 the surveys and polls that we reviewed um, and highlights the need to evaluate whether these surveys are up to the task of reflecting the opinions and priorities of a diverse UK public. And as I mentioned right at the beginning, significantly none of the surveys within five years before the integrated review mentioned citizens or people or frame security in that way. Um, it's very state-based. It's therefore essential that we interrogate the methods and framing and language of survey questions, as well as the field of knowledge as a whole, what questions are not asked, what are the gaps? Um, the study illustrates some of the limitations of public opinion serving on security in the UK and the focus in particular that it, that it puts on the state rather than people um, as the object of security, as well as the emphasis on national priorities over shared global responsibilities um, and the focus on militarized responses to building and maintaining security. This, it can be argued, largely, largely reflects the assumptions of the corporate media, think tanks, and commercial polling companies. At the same time, the surveys, the, the, the few surveys that were designed um, by organizations that are not part of the establishment, um, NGOs, um, also reflect their, their assumptions and definitions about the nature of security. This, this highlights the the role that surveys commissioned and designed by the polling establishment may, may play in, in producing these elite or dominant narratives of security. And this really is, is, I think, worth considering. So for public opinion research to contribute to making security policy making more inclusive, um, it needs to use methodologies that look beyond these, the limited security elite views and in, incorporate a broader range of perspectives, a broader range of security stakeholders. Um, and I think to do this, we can learn a lot from the shortcomings of the existing approaches that we re reviewed, but also um, building on the emerging good practice and um, examples and sort of methodologies that were identified as, 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 as producing a, a richer, more comprehensive um, narrative on security. So with that in mind, I will turn to the recommendations um, and just give a quick overview of them. They're, they're more detailed um, in the report if people want to find out a bit more. So the first set is for policymakers, um, and the second set is for pollsters and others involved in surveying um, public opinion on security. So for the security policymakers, UK security policymakers use opinion surveys as part of a broader public engagement strategy, adopt mixed method approaches to surveying public opinion, adopt more inclusive methodologies for surveying public opinion, and engage proactively with a, with a wider range of public stakeholders in national security reviews. For, um, for pollsters and others involved in surveying public opinion on security, we recommended eliciting the public's own understanding of security so that responses aren't limited to these state-based definitions. Avoid closed questions that limit the public um, to just selecting um, threats and responses that are pre-identified by security elites. Um, use methodologies that elicit the perspectives of a diverse UK public, including minority and marginalised groups. And importantly, when publishing survey findings, explain the purpose Method, methodology definitions of key terms and how response options were selected. I think the final one's especially important. We don't see this in a lot of surveys. How, 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 how were these predefined responses selected? Whose opinions do they reflect? 
And that's it, I'll leave it there. <laughs> Thank you, Richard. So Thank you very much, Lila. It was a great overview of uh, the report and its findings, um, which is, again, very much worth checking out in full on the website. So we'll turn now to uh, Professor Nick Vaughan Williams. He's Professor of International Security, Vice Provost and Chair of the Faculty of Social Sciences at the University of Warwick. Uh, his research focuses on the international politics of borders, migration and security, as well as perceptions and experiences of everyday security threats in the UK. Uh, his research includes large sample surveys and focus groups of ordinary people, I can use that term, uh, and he is no stranger to the policy world, having presented his findings, he can be commissioned by the UK government, uh, European Commission and the Maltese government as well. So Nick, over to you. Thanks very much indeed, uh, Richard, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. I, I just want to begin by congratulating uh, Lilla on a, an absolutely fantastic uh, report. Um, it's really interesting, it's really insightful, it's extremely well researched, and I, I for one think its findings and recommendations deserve uh, widespread attention. For me, the report highlights um, what I see as a paradox in the relationship between public policy and um, public opinion regarding national security in the UK. On the one hand, we've seen, as Lilla mentioned, uh, successive national security strategies uh, emphasizing the role of citizens in supporting, cultivating um, societal uh, security and resilience. And yet, on the other hand, we know that public awareness of national security strategies is low. Um, there is little public engagement in, in the formulation of national security uh, policy, and frankly, not much is known about how diverse UK citizens um, think about and experience uh, security in the context of their daily lives. So I'm very interested in Lilla's report because it addresses a number of issues that I've been working on in the context of that paradox over the last uh, 10, 15 years or so. Um, and I guess in this context, two projects of mine um, might be relevant. The first uh, was called Public Perceptions of Security Threats in Britain. Uh, that was um, uh, coordinated with a colleague, Daniel Stevens, at Exeter um, a while back now, 2012 to 13. Uh, that was a mixed methods project funded by the ESRC um, that included a, a nationally representative online survey and 20 focus groups to explore how UK citizens conceptualize uh, security. And that, that led to the book, um, Everyday Security Threats. Um, and then the second project uh, was Border Narratives. Um, and this was a qualitative project um, funded by the uh, Leverhulme Trust, which involved 24 focus groups across 11 EU cit uh, cities to understand how uh, EU citizens experienced the so-called uh, migration crisis and and that led to um vernacular border security which which came out um a year or so ago i guess i wanted to reflect on perhaps five key points um that connect my research and lilla's uh report the first is that the notion of public opinion is of course a contested and frankly ambiguous concept. For some, public opinion is a preformed object of analysis that, that we can measure through surveys and opinion polls and so on. For others, um, public opinion is more of a social construct. It's produced through the methods that we use in order to study it, in inverted commas, and perhaps public opinion for those um, colleagues uh, is seen very much as being produced through intersubjective interaction. I suppose minimally, uh, and where I stand, we might say that there's always a politics of public opinion. There's always a politics of producing the public. And for this reason, as Lilla's report highlights, we need to think carefully about the framing of the questions. Uh, this will shape results um, and, and have a bearing on what and or whom is included. And in, in the first project I mentioned, our surveys and focus groups suggest very much that individuals perceive different kinds of issues as security threats, 
when we think at different scales, whether or not that's at the personal level, uh, the community level, uh, national level or global level. Um, I think therefore policymakers need to be attentive to those dynamics when drawing on survey findings as quote unquote evidence uh, for policy formulation. That's the first point. The second point is that I think when we think about public opinion polling specifically on the issue of security, uh, the, the questions themselves can have a securitizing effect on the public that those methods produce. So one example um, to pick out of my uh, latest research is that in the standard Eurobarometer 84, um, at the height of arrivals to Europe in, in autumn 2015, the question was asked, in your opinion, should additional measures be taken to fight illegal migration of people from outside the EU? Well, you know, unsurprisingly, 90% uh, of EU citizens uh, um, said uh, yes. And, you know, because of the way that that question was framed, um, we might want to call into question uh, policy uh, conclusions that therefore, you know, a vast majority of EU citizens want tougher border security. Um, and I think we need to be very attentive, therefore, to what I call the, the securitization of public opinion by methodological design. The, the third point is that is that clearly we need to take into consideration the broader socio-economic political and cultural contexts in which surveys um, on security take place. Um, here I'm thinking about the impact of disinformation and post-truth uh, political communication cultures and how they've sown the seeds of, of uncertainty and confusion. Um, and, you know, some of the work that I've been doing recently in focus groups, inc including in the UK uh, on migration and border security, suggests that, that there is widespread um, misunderstanding of of these of these issues uh, and of security in general that leads to my fourth point um which is that uh there is evidence that you know there is widespread uh non-knowledge or ignorance among citizens of of these issues um our 2012 survey suggested that less than 10 percent of uk citizens are aware of the national security strategy Many of our citizens in focus groups um, uh, felt disenfranchised from the formulation and implementation of uh, that policy. There was a fundamental disconnect between the range of issues that policymakers and citizens considered to be security threats. So in our survey uh, in 2012, only 3% saw terrorism as a personal threat, despite this being a tier one uh, issue in the national security strategy. There are a whole range of other issues that were far more pertinent to people's everyday lives. And of course, many from minoritized groups uh, commonly felt that govern government messages actually increase rather than decrease their perceptions of threat and insecurity. So finally, um, my fifth point would be that when thinking about the conditions, perhaps for a more inclusive approach to researching these matters, it's really important that we think about the kinds of questions that we're asking of whom. I think there's value in qualitative work to better understand the contested meanings behind public understandings of, of security, threat, risk, resilience, and so on. And for me, narratives are really important because um, we're dealing with uh, social uh, meaning making so combining methods, as Lilla's report suggests, would seem to be a, a fruitful way forward. Clearly, there's a need for more research about how intersecting considerations around gender, age, class, ethnicity, and religion shape those everyday um, understandings. And I suppose I want, to I want to conclude my last point by saying that also our focus groups um, suggest widespread interest in and demands for greater democratic engagement with the formulation of national security policy. And so I think beyond being polled, uh, our focus group said that um, there was very much uh, a, a political demand for a move from, if you like, simply consumer surveying of views to a, a paradigm of greater citizen participation in the formulation of national security strategy. So. Um, 
I hope that um, you know I've indicated some some of the ways in which my my work uh, intersects with the findings of of Lilla's um, excellent report, and and I would urge everyone on this call to read that report. Thanks. Thanks very much, Nick. And I, I would certainly urge people to read your two books, and, and especially on everyday security threats. Uh, I think that's been hugely helpful for our work. And this this whole idea of the paradox that you talk about is is really central to the kind of thing that rethinking security uh, works on in this sort of black box area of national security and um, elite decision making. Thank you. So we'll now turn to our third speaker, who is Dr. Saria Truvalil Contractor. She is Associate Professor in Sociology of Islam in the Center for Trust, Peace and Social Relations at Coventry University, which is our partner in the Alternative Security Review. And she's also been the chair of the Muslims in Britain Research Network. Uh, her research uh, emphasizes collaborative methodologies and has included major studies of Islam and British education, uh, as well as leading the uh, public opinion surveys components of our own Alternative Security Review. So, sorry, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. And, and thank you, Leela and, and Nick. Tough acts to follow. Um, I'd like to start by, you know, looking a little bit at, at, at Leela's, Leela's report. And she quite rightly starts with the significance of uh, public opinion surveys in, in shaping formulation, but then also problematizes it in that are these representative? And, and, and you know, as, as Nick was saying a minute ago, who we are, you know, what are the kinds of questions we ask and, and you know, what purpose do these questions serve in, in, in the greater picture of the politics of security? Now, in my own work, I have worked with and for British Muslim communities. Um, I've run surveys with them and I know, you know, my the both qualitative as well as quantitative evidence suggests how tired Muslim communities are by with this relationship that lots of surveys make between Islam and ordinary Muslims and, and terrorism. Um, and, and that's how they are, they, they feel resentment, they feel sidelined, and they feel security policy there does not reflect their opinion. And that is only one, you know, minoritized group among so many others. We we are not, as Leela points out, that we're not collecting intersectional you know, we're not collecting data about individuals' intersectional identities. We're not trying to see in current surveys where people are coming from when they answer questions about security. And often there is this imposition of national security speak and national security issues on people and on communities so as to produce this public narrative that then goes on to inform policy. So you're kind of in this, you know, catch uh, 22 situation where, you know, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy in some ways. Now, I do a lot of work with children in the care system. And when I ask social workers, when I ask care experience young people, what does security mean to you? It It is a completely different narrative. It is about having a safe home. It is, I mean, even it, it, it's even more intimate that, uh, than that. It is about having people whom you can trust will look after you and who will have your best interests. When I speak to people in the, the interfaith world where I do a lot of work, security can, can mean you know, meaningful engagement, meaningful understanding between Britain's different religious and non-religious groups that extends beyond mere toleration into respect, into meaningful dialogue, into understanding. So security can mean very, very different things. Now, coming back to Leela's report, in her report, she encourages us to think about how and why we phrase questions. She encourages us, us to think about open questions where we are not just giving, you know, respondents two options to choose from. And I think underlying all of this is to she, she challenges us to think about researcher positionality. Now, as a feminist scholar, I am very much aware of how, you know, hierarchies of social dominance, 
determine how we produce knowledge. So we know for a fact that a lot of women's history, a lot of women's contributions um, are hidden. We, we sort of easily forget. We easily forget that George Eliot was actually uh, a, a woman. And we, act, we also forget that she had connections to Coventry. I like to say that wherever I go, George Eliot had connections to Coventry. Um, but, you know, and, and if you add further levels of intersectionality. So if you are a minoritized woman, woman from a particular background, and if you were from a working class background, there is even less a chance that your history is going to be known. So I think what Leela challenges us to think about is how do these power dynamics determine the kind of questions that we ask in surveys about security? Now, when we were designing the Alternative Security Review and we were designing, as, as Richard, Richard mentioned, we are partners, we were very lucky to have early drafts of Leela's report and we were able to cons incorporate some of her recommendations into the kind of serving that we did. We've, so we, we used Leela's recommendations, we, we ran two surveys, we ran a youth survey with respondents just over a thousand respondents and a public opinion survey with just over 2000 respondents. We, we ran them in partnership with the survey company Savanta. But in designing the survey, we took her considerations in, you know, we took, worked on her, we used her recommendations. And I think it's been really fruitful. And I'm, what I'm going to do in the next two or three minutes that I have of this presentation is to reflect very briefly on how we put her recommendations into play. And, and you know, what have been the benefits of doing that? What is the kind of data that we have generated? Um, my data comes with a caveat that it's still very much analysis in process, so not really the citing widely just yet. They will be ready in another couple of months. Now, the first thing Leela challenged, you know, got us to think about was you know, how, how can you use mixed methods? How can we ensure, that, how can mixed methods help us think about survey questions in ways that move away from privilege, you know, academic privilege in our case, um, security definitions. So the first thing we did was a wide range of methods. We used photo elicitation, creative methodologies to sort of see what people were actually talking about, somewhat mirroring Nick's work. What were they talking about in relation to security? We then started our survey with an open question that asked respondents to tell us, you know, how did they understand security? Um, and you know it does cause a lot more work in survey when you've surveys when you've got open questions, but it seems we've ended up with three thousand definitions of security, or and and a lot of synergy across them. A synergy in that people are talking about whether they were young or old. It seems a home is really important. Loving relationships are really important. Economic financial well being seems really important. People seem to have really reflected in answering these question, this open question, taking their time. Um, and one of my favorite answers out of the 3,000, so it was really difficult to choose, was, I don't know who this person was, but he, he or she says, they say, having a safe, warm home, a stable job, stable friendships, relationships, and not having to worry too much about money. Now, the reason I like this answers as nuance, not just a home, but a warm home, reflecting, I think, the energy crisis and other things. Not, not wanting too much money, they're not greedy, but, but you know, not worry, having to worry too much about money, so they're okay with a little bit. And another, you know, another person gave me, gave us quite a long answer, but they ended with, and I really loved this bit, not entirely a lack of worry, but knowing that everything will be all right in the end. Um, but so and, and then so and then what we asked people was does living in the UK, so we now go into the quants, does living in the UK give you the security that you described in question number one? Well, 63% of the general population said yes, 21% said they no, and 15% weren't very sure. When it comes to young people, it's slightly less optimistic because the number of people who said yes went down from 63% to 54%. So young people seem to be concerned about things. And, and perhaps in future, because we've got interviews and focus group discussions taking place, that is something for us to 
explore. And one last bit of stats before I go away. We wanted to see how people defined, understood security now, not from the open-ended personal framework, but from the literature security policy framework and we gave our respondents a range of options you know state security options personal security options to see what really mattered to them and we asked them to rank these these options now in our public opinion survey 39.1 percent of our respondents ranked um, this particular option is number one, which was ability to go with, go about my daily life without threat. 41% ranked financial economic well-being as their number one choice. 23% said a strong military power. 12% said effective law enforcement. For young people, it changes a little bit in that there seems to be more emphasis on personal security and even less emphasis on state security. Only 13% of young people ranked a strong military power as their first option. So to close, right, and I could stay here forever, it's fascinating stuff. To close, I think Leela Fernley's report has, you know, Leela, your report has given us a framework that is relevant and useful, not just for security studies, but it is you know, your recommendations are things that I think we need to take even more widely into how, you know, sociological studies of everyday life. You know, how do we, in my work, how do I talk about women and history? How do I talk about and survey children in care? So thank you very much. Many congratulations on, you know, putting it together. And I'm sure it's, you know, it will be impactful, not just for security studies, but but way beyond. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much for the opportunity and for listening. Thank you, Zoria. That's great. And a big theme there. Congratulations that are on a, on a really great report with some really meaningful recommendations and, and analysis that we will take forward to uh, different sectors. And we'll be pursuing this with policymakers and with pollsters, with the media and academics and all those involved in this kind of thing. And of course, through the alternative security review with the work that Zaria and her team are are leading on, we are challenging that with our own um, take on how to do these things. I'm not seeing many questions coming yet. Don't be shy uh, as attendees if you have questions to ask. Um, we have space for those. Um, I will just kick off with an initial one about um, the role of the media in all of this. Um, to the media commissions and publishes lots of polls. Um, but what is what is their kind of stake in this security narrative or defining security? And and Lilla, maybe you could start. Do you see much difference between who in the media is commissioning these polls? For example, the, the Guardian or the Daily Mail or the, the Times? What difference does that make? Um, I would say it's it's in the surveys that we reviewed, it, it's most evident on the the polling on intervention in conflict. Uh, the, those are the those are the polls that tend to be commissioned more by the media and by newspapers. So it's on on those that I'll comment. Um, I think there is a difference. Maybe as you know, it's 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 not huge, but it's noticeable. Um, and it and probably fairly predictable. Like, for example, um, yeah, the Observer, as it was then, um, mentions diplomatic pressure as a response to Syria, as does the Daily Mirror in their polls. But it's not evident in, for example, the polling from um, commissioned by the Sun um, or many of the ones by the Times. So I think that does, I think there is a difference. They don't all use the same polling companies. Um, the Sun and the Times are both, both polls commissioned by, um, commissioned by them, but, but carried out by YouGov. I don't know what that relationship is there, you know, um, in terms of how much influence the commissioners of the surveys have versus those who, who, who conduct them. But, but I would say that there is an influence and, um, you know, obviously, if survey findings make make front page news, which they sometimes do, if it's a if it's a, a newspaper commissioning it, then the impact is far greater both on the 
public imagination and potentially on, on, on policy debates. It was the newspaper headlines and the polls in the headlines that were cited in the, in the Commons debate on Syria in 2013, a lot of the time, so. Thanks. Nick Rosario, do you, what role do you see for the media in um, following and responsibility or uh, influence of, of them as actors in this security narrative set up? I can say something very, very briefly. I mean, in the context of our 2012 study, we were very keen to be attentive to the, the, the context in, in which our polling and the focus group work took place. And, um, you know, bit building on previous research, we, we, we know that the news media may exacerbate certain um, you know, perceptions of, of threats with, with a focus on conflict, with a focus on um, catastrophe, you know, these, um, these emphases, which of course sell um, papers, will, will have an impact on, on public perceptions of, of threat at, at different levels. And I, I remember that when we did a search, you know, it was clear that certain outlets, um, I think the Daily Telegraph in particular, had um you know an intensity of uh, media reporting around security threats in the context of the of the then olympic games when our um polling was taking place so i think you know whereas other outlets um uh, i perhaps don't need to name them may not have such a uh, an emphasis so clearly we need to understand how certain outlets are reporting in what ways and how that then may filter through based on the consumption of uh, media at the level of, of the individual um, respondent. I suppose the only other thing I wanted to say through um, the focus group work is that, um, you know, it, it is not the case, however, that, you know, uh, individuals um, consume these messages uncritically. And actually a lot of our focus group work was spent um, discussing the distrust uh, that um, many, many had of media reporting. And from there, um, a concern about you know, not knowing where to go to find authoritative information about, for example, migration or other you know, issues relating to um, you know, uh, re relating to the to our topic. So uh, I, I think the focus group work, the qualitative work is important in order to um, contextualize and to hear those counter narratives, because it's not simply the case that people, um, you know, it's not simply the case that people ventriloquize, if you like, hear in, in the media. And that that gap is actually really fruitful when it comes to um, research. Richard, you're muted. But if you want me to come in, I'll, I'll come sorry, in briefly. Sorry. Um, so I, I was thinking about a survey that me, um, together with Professor Matthew Guest from Durham, Professor Alison Scott Bauman from SOAS, and Dr. Shrub Naki, we, we ran an EHRC funded project a few years ago now, um, and I that looked at narratives of and lived experiences of Islam and university campuses across the UK. Now, as part of that research, we we ran a big survey, and and I'm, I'm I want to I I remember we asked people, and I don't have the numbers in front of me, but one question we asked participants was respondents was you know where what are the sources. Of what is the, what are the main sources of information when it comes to understandings of religion in general, and and we gave them a whole range of options and 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 when it came to religion in general, participants rated friends and and family the most, um, theological leaders you know so parish priests and whatnot came second and then there was um, the media. We then had another question where we asked people you know what are your main sources of knowledge when it comes to Islam in particular. And suddenly the media occupied number one spot, indicating, I think, the significance of media when it comes to understandings of minoritized identity.
ethnicity, minoritized people with minoritized identities might not always be in your friend circle, in your network, certainly if you live in rural context, you know, so depending on where you live. And that's where the media really has a role in, in shaping understandings. But I completely agree with what Nick was saying in that once people engage with diversity and, and we did a bit of qualitative work around this, we saw that when people met Muslims are indeed, you know, individuals from other minoritized faiths, other minoritized ethnicities, ethnicities, they are perceptions of, and in the context of our research, the perceptions of Islam changed completely from the media narrative. And in particular, I remember a young African Caribbean heritage, you know, a man from uh, African Caribbean heritage, and he spoke to us about how prior to meeting Muslims, he was scared of them. And when he was told as a first year university student, his roommate was going to be Muslim, he considered deferring his studies for a year, but he then met his roommate and they became good friends and he understood what halal food was. It wasn't a recipe. And he says, I realized they weren't all terrorists there. And Islam brings everybody together. It's sort of, uh, and he used the word, a brotherly faith. Um, so I think we should give credit to the general public where they where it is due, but yeah, the media does have um, a significant role. And if you want to read about the Islam on Campus project, just Google representing Islam on Campus, and you'll find lots of stuff. Thank you. We have a question from uh, Celia in Keeley, I think, um, and she says focus groups have been mentioned. Would anyone comment on the use of citizen assemblies in the process? Of awareness of the wider issues. Is that one of the things we uh, maybe mean when we talk about mixed methods research, or is that something beyond the scope of the uh, uh, opinion survey? Um, Perhaps Nick, you could respond. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously, there is. Um a tradition of working in democratic, um, deliberative de democratic theory that seeks to understand how we can move um, towards more qualitative, in-depth, um, longitudinal understandings of uh, views. And, and I think, um, you know, assemblies are potentially one way to go. Um, I mean, I think we probably have to uh, say a, a few a few things. Um, uh, so, firstly, any kind of methodology is is clearly not without its um, implications. And so, I, I suppose uh, you know, I for one would be cautious about discounting any role that surveys can play. I mean, clearly, you know, a well designed, well thought through survey that is reflective. Uh, of the assumptions that it makes that is reflexive in drawing on perhaps you know other qualitative work in its design could yield extremely interesting insights um equally you know uh focus groups that ask closed questions that make all sorts of assumptions about the referent object of security whose security matters you know those those methods would not be um, an adequate corrective to some of the issues that Lilla's report highlights. So I, I don't think it's about the methodology in an, in and of itself. I think it's about um, the disposition of those designing the methods. Um, I think it's about an openness ultimately to um, exposing the research to findings that may be you know, unforeseen, challenging, whatever. But that is the caution that if if we if if frankly we have that tautology that Surya was talking about, you know, the self fulfilling prophecy effect, whereby you know we simply produce the the results that that we want through the questions that we pose, then um, not only is that poor science, but politically it can be extremely. Um, uh, um, it can have extreme consequences when uh, the output is considered to be incontrovertible evidence, quote unquote, on the basis of which policy can then be formulated. So I, I don't think there's anything, you know, 
I, I don't think there's anything about any of the methods we've discussed, including assembly assemblies that that um, in and of themselves are progressive or otherwise. Um, I think there is something deeper at stake in terms of the um, uh, in, in terms of the, the outlook of those designing in order to be reflective of uh, perhaps unintended consequences of, of their um, methodological design. If I, if I may, just, just to come in there, Richard, briefly again, I think absolutely the positionalities of the researcher, why are we doing what we're doing, but also being transparent about who we are and you know how we impact upon the field want of a better word and how the field impacts upon us because you know when we when we go into research we we take for a long time you know the res the researcher was expected to be objective and neutral um and, and you know now most researchers agree that that is you know nigh impossible or although every now and then i get told i can't be neutral but you know I, I the only reason i can't be objective is because i'm a feminist and i get told off but I think enough scholars is enough discussion within scholarship to know that research positionality is key. The other really crucial thing I wanted to say is, you know, rather than thinking about any one method methodology, it is about thinking, bringing these methodologies into negotiation with each other, ensuring, you know, so for example, you know, when we were doing our photo elicitation because of the kind of people who participated in one of our groups, there was a real variness, a fearfulness about police and police presence. Whereas when we look at some of our survey writings, the police is one thing that people want you know, support for, together with the NHS, of course. Um, but also thinking, you know, Leila's point about representativeness, about minority and minoritized positionalities, thinking about who actually comes and participates in these methods. You know, if you have a citizen citizen assembly with people who are sim all very similar to each other, you know, again, it is that, you know, you get the same sort of information back. So really thinking about representativeness and who's actually participating in the methods we use and then bringing the findings into negotiation with each other. Thank you. I just will move on to probably a final question, given the time. Um, Ivan from North Dorset. Um, so that's a long question. I'm going to paraphrase it to ask you, starting with Lila. Um, what you think about opinion polling on the war in Ukraine over the past year? And that's kind of outside the scope of the, the report because I think your cutoff was 2021 for the last poll you looked at. Um, but what do you think about the way that um, polls on on support for the war in Ukraine have been um, been phrased in the UK context? Um, I have to say, as as you point out, I haven't thoroughly reviewed them um, as, as this was the, was the cut up point and I have you know not focused so much on these issues since but I have had a brief look at them and I think what I've noticed is, is some of the same issues are evident as I you know as the sort of analysis of the surveys on Syria it's this presenting primarily militarized options um, of the ones that I've seen, I, I can't I can't pretend to know uh, what all of them say. I, I haven't looked at all of them, but the ones that I have seen is it's that that same kind of pattern of not presenting other alternative, which which raises the, the sort of danger of those you know it, it, it appearing to be a choice between intervening militarily or doing nothing. Um, I think some of the same risks are in 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 those those polls when, when taken as a whole, but that's that's just on a, a fairly sort of brief, uh, you know, a, a overview that I've done of those polls. Thanks. And uh, Nick and Sari, if you have any final comments to make before we close, please do. I, I, I looked at the long question that i even put in because i i know nothing about ukraine the polling on 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 ukraine no other things about ukraine but not polling on it and he he said that so in his question he tells us the whole story and then he says 
the 23 percent only only 23 percent selected the option encourage a negotiated peace to end the fighting even if this means russia still has control over some parts of ukraine now i am suggesting and this is me just being cheeky if they had deleted the second clause of that option so if the option was only encourage a negotiated peace to end the fighting i think we would have seen a very dis different response to that question because people do like peace but they don't want to give russia ukraine so that's conflating two diff very different things have been complete can you know conflated into one option i'll stop yeah. <laughs> I, I've just I've just read through the whole question myself now as, as you spoke and and I fully agree. Um, I think that, that you know some of the other ones that surveys that I've looked at have also sort of made a made a choice between would you rather have funds go towards military or charity work? And this is you know charity work is not defined in in any way. All of us know that that could mean any number of things. Whereas this is very clear other option, which is which is which is military. So in these subtle ways, um, you're, you're being led in a certain direction, it, it, it feels. Um, and I agree now that I read this, that the full question it is pro problematic, to say the least. Thanks. Nick, any final thoughts from you? Well, there's potentially so much to say on this one. Um, I think I'll, I'll limit myself to to the reflection that, in general, the uh, media and um, public debate about um, population displacement in the context of the Ukrainian war and public sentiment in response to it, it is is seems to be very different to the reaction to the the 2015-16. So-called crisis, and my observation would be that you know, um, ostensibly there is something progressive, perhaps uh, in in that shift. But I, I, I think there are reasons to be a, a little more skeptical because um, often the discussion about Ukraine and um, hospitality towards displaced population is framed in, ter in terms of geographical proximity. But if you look on Google Earth. The distance um, from Brussels to Kiev uh, is pretty much the same as the distance from Brussels to Tripoli. There's there's a couple of hundred kilometers in it, and so I'm suspicious uh, about uh, the geographical proximity argument. Um, and you know, I think we need to interrogate um, questions about you know, um, would you be um, willing to house uh, a Ukrainian refugee? When, when framed in, in that sort of language, when, when we know that um, references to sort of ways of life are perhaps um, metaphors for, uh, for other differences that, that are not um, made visible in, in the way that the debate is framed and that um, polls are, are, are um, constructed. Thanks very much. Yeah, I think that's, that's very telling in the, some of the differences between this particular security issue and the, the migration crisis or issue in 2015-16 or, or indeed the Syria vote in 2013 that Lilla talks about in her report. But we need to close now, so it just falls to me to thank Lilla for this excellent report. Thank you to Zaria and Nick uh, and Lilla for joining this really interesting panel. Thanks to everyone who's attended and asked questions, uh, or indeed is, is watching the video of it later. Um, if you want to find out more about our alternative security review, do please look at the Rethinking Security website where there's loads of information, not just about what we're doing and our partners at uh, Coventry University are doing, as well as the report, but also how to get involved with it. So there's a public call for evidence. We'd love to hear what uh, everyone out there thinks themselves about uh, their security needs and priorities, how they define security, what they think the government or uh, authorities should be doing about our security or insecurity. Um, and we'll also be doing an international consultation. So if you're not in the UK, uh, but you have strong thoughts about UK foreign policy, we'd love for you to be involved in our uh, international consultation on perceptions of UK foreign policy on the 6th and 7th of June 
loads more details about those on our website and on our social media. But for now, thanks everyone for joining and enjoy the report. Goodbye.